Hey church, uh, welcome to First Chinese Baptist Church of Dallas. We're so glad that you're here joining us this Sunday to worship with us. And it's so awesome that uh, we can have technology to to worship God and and just over, you know, throughout the course of history, no matter what has happened, whether it's been um, viruses uh, or uh, Christians being persecuted um, or even uh, violence that, you know, have kept Christians from gathering together in a, in a building, um, worship has never ceased. Uh, there has never been a time where there wasn't praise given to God. And, and so praise God that, you know, even with COVID, we can all still have, you know, the opportunity to um, gather together virtually uh, and, and worship God together. You know, something that um, Joanne and I have just been reading over the past couple of months throughout um, our journey in the Old Testament is that God is good. God is good. Um, and I know that even today, that's what we're going to hear from uh, Pastor Voltaire. And, and that's our hope. Um, it's so easy, like throughout this time, to, to lose hope. Um, I think I shared a little bit of that. Uh, last last Sunday, but just with everything going on, um, we often question where where is God, and so we turn to things that that aren't God, and um, we turn to find security, uh, find comfort, uh, find hope, um, in, in whatever that we can uh, place it in. Um, and yet, as we read the Old Testament, God is always working, and God is always good, and um, even if there are um, bad leaders or judges in place, even when um, the Israelites turn to idol worship, um, God always uh, drew them back to Him. And, and, and so that's our hope, you know, as we sing uh, these songs today, that uh, we sing about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, um, the love of God, and um, who He is as our Father that you know, you would remember that and really take that to heart. And, uh, when days get hard, when weeks get hard, when months get hard, when we question when will this all ever end, when will we ever get back to a normal, if will there ever be a normal, um, you know, God is always working and praise God that he is so good and so true to his character. So why don't you join us in worship together?
continue our time in worship by singing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. pray together. Father, in Psalm 100, we read, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God, we pray this prayer of praise to You. Even in difficult times, we want to praise You. We want to worship You. Because, God, You are so worthy of praise. You are so full of glory. And we give You all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. And so, Father God, throughout these weeks and these days, would you remind us of your goodness? God, when it's so tough, when it's so hard to live life, when circumstances are not ever what we expected, God, you are constant and you are faithful. And your goodness runs throughout all generations. So give us a hope. Help us to see that your love endures forever and that you are constantly working for something that is greater. And so give us hope and help us be light to others in this world. We thank you and we love you for all that you're doing. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome once again online to FCBC Dallas. We're glad that you can join us for worship today. This week we are covering part two of our message on generations where we're going to take a look at the rest of the Jordan River crossing by God's people in Joshua 4 and see what it means for us to share memorial stones with the coming generations. Last week, we learned about three important attributes of God as He led His people, a nation of two million through the Jordan River by miraculously halting its waters across a 25 mile length. The first one is that God is all knowing. He guides His people through unfamiliar territory. When we don't know what lies ahead, we must have faith that God already knows for us. The second one is that God is all-present. He leads His people through uncertain times. When we're not sure of whom we can depend on, we must have faith that God will be there. And the third is that God is all-powerful. He carries His people through unmanageable circumstances. When we come across an impossible task, we must have faith that God will get us through it. Stories are an important part of our lives. They tell us where we came from, how we got there, why we do the things we do, who did things that impact our lives today, and what we have been given to keep moving forward. My dad was born in August of 1944, while World War II was going on. He's the youngest of four children. His parents, my grandparents, had their roots in a northern region of the Philippines called Ilocos Norte. I remember, like it was yesterday, my grandmother telling me stories of their family during that time. On Christmas Eve, December 24, 1944, my grandfather was assigned to guard a bridge that led into town. But Japanese soldiers attacked and killed my grandfather. At that time, he was only 20 years old and my dad was four months old. Having four very young children, my grandmother fled to the mountains in order to escape the soldiers. She told me a story of how the Japanese patrols went right by the cave they were hiding in, 
while she was trying to keep her children calm and her four-month-old baby quiet. It was a miracle that the soldiers didn't come into the cave and kill them all. My grandmother was a strong woman. She had to be in order to raise four kids by herself and take care of the farm that they were able to keep after the war. She never remarried, but told me many more stories that helped me understand how I got to where I am today. Those stories even helped me to understand more about my dad and his siblings. It boggles my mind though to think that if the soldiers had found and killed my grandmother, my two aunties, my uncle, and my dad, obviously I would not be here right now. But neither would my three daughters, my brother and sister, my cousins, my nieces and nephews, and all the generations to come, and the people whose lives we have all intersected. Well, that is one of many memorial stones that my grandmother left me. And I realize as I'm saying this, that I need to share these memorial stones of God's sovereignty with my own daughters. Oftentimes we forget that God's sovereignty affords us opportunities to experience His presence, His power, and His providence in our lives. I would like to encourage each and every one of us to think about the Jordans that we have crossed, or maybe are even crossing now, and pray about how we would want our children's children, the ones who aren't even born yet, to hear stories of God's sovereignty and how His presence, power, and providence have gotten us to destinations that He has in store for us. And these destinations are not only for us, they are also part of a plan for our future generations to experience God in their own lives. Please join me in following along as we read Joshua chapter 4 together. Joshua 4. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priests' feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, 
the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. But the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Father, once again for this day a day that you have made, that you have made for us to live for you, grow closer to you, and even introduce others to your son Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word and for the truths that we may glean from it as we walk with your son Jesus so that we may become more like him through our obedience to you and our faith in you. I pray, Lord God, that we would take our experiences of crossing our Jordans and tell stories that would glorify your name in all the earth. May your word fill our minds and penetrate our hearts so that we may be transformed as you bring us from glory to glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, I've been able to experience God's sovereignty as you've learned to follow Him through unfamiliar times, seek Him at certain times, and trust Him in those circumstances. The people of Israel did, and all they had to do was take one little step river that led them to all three of the challenges. But are you finding yourself standing at the overflowing banks of a fast-flowing river, not sure of how to get through? If you're basing your decisions direction that God, you're ready for of, you'll never be able to move forward in faith. You can't experience God's power without first stepping into the water. He has commanded you to cross. At this point in the journey of the Israelites, this new generation has already heard the stories of Moses, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna falling from heaven, the law being given to them, the building of the tabernacle, the establishment of offerings and feasts, the experience of counting and spying, the hardship of wandering and dying, and then receiving the second law. And now they are crossing the Jordan River. As you've just read in chapter 4, the nation of Israel is now completing their passing over the Jordan. Before they complete this God-sized the Lord commands Joshua to work with his people in collecting stones. God has them do this because they need to learn that God's presence among his people brings him glory as they share stories of his miraculous work to all generations. God involves all two million people by having Joshua in verse 2, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man. And to take 12 stones, in verse 3, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. God did this because he wanted future generations to see them and ask, in verse 6, what do these stones mean to you? That way, the current generation would begin the 
beautiful storytelling of how, in verse 7, the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. This is important because the Ark of the Covenant was one of the most instrumental symbols of faith and God's presence. Like the statues of gods that were idolized by the Israelites, the Ark of the Covenant served as a religious symbol where the people could meet with God. Hovered over the Ark when the priests were present. It reminded people that God was in their very midst cutting off the waters of the Jordan himself. Now, these stones that were collected, they would be a sign that educates future generations about their heritage, and more importantly, about their God. They will see that sign in the stones that came from the Jordan when its waters were cut off. They were cut off because the ark of the covenant passed through the Jordan. It was because of God's presence that they could experience His miraculous work. And after they collected the stones, they would complete the crossing. In so doing, they would learn that God's power over all the earth brings Him glory as His people obey his every command. In the latter part of verse 10, we see the people passed over in haste. Again, imagine over 2 million people crossing over the dry Jordan River bed in haste. It must have been a sight to truly behold. But there was a particular emphasis here in verses 12 to 13. It is actually the beginning of their military venture into Canaan. In crossing the Jordan, Israel at last enters the land promised to their ancestors. At the same time, they are entering enemy territory with all the dangers and challenges that this might imply. So it makes sense that they would appear armed and prepare for battle. For us today, these really bring to mind the spiritual warfare that the New Testament describes as equally challenging. It requires preparation and armor, like we have read in Ephesians. But it was not the mere military might of 40,000 men that exhibited God's power. It was control over all the earth, including the River Jordan. In verse 15 it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the Ark of the Testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua gave the command, and when the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. In continuing to obey God, the nation of Israel witnessed everything go back to what it was before they to the river. They experienced God's power over all continued to obey His every command. So now they find themselves in Canaan and begin to set up camp. Here they are to learn that God's providence through all circumstances brings Him glory as He infallibly accomplishes His will through His people. It's interesting to take note of the fact that the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. So, until now, we in the flood stage of the Jordan, which is in the spring. Now we see that it is the 10th day of the first month. This same date actually appears in Exodus 12, where it introduces the preparations for the Passover. 
and that occurs on the 14th day. As events of are designed to really prepare the Passover to begin on this day, it looks like the crossing of the Jordan River prepares for the celebration of the Passover of Gilgal, which is going to happen in chapter 5. As an aside, though, there are no certain indication uh, that actually show the site of the Gilgal. And it's not necessary or even likely that all the occurrences of Gilgal in the Bible refer to the same location. The name simply means circle. And it's really a good description for a fortified camp like what Joshua may have had in his time. Well, in verse 20 through 21, Joshua erects the memorial. His instructions enable the crossing, and this memorial will commemorate the event, the experience. Just like in verses 6 through 7, the memorial will evoke questions from future generations. In verse 21, what do these stones mean? But in verses 22 through 23, we see how they are to answer. And unlike the explanation in verses 6 through 7 that emphasize the Ark of the Covenant, this one focuses on the dry ground that Israel crossed. The cutting off of the waters was the key factor in getting those stones. The people experienced dry riverbed on which they walked. It would have been impossible for them to retrieve those stones any other way. But look at verse 23. This is the explicit link between the crossing of the Jordan and that of the Red Sea. Verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which He dried up for us until we passed over. But notice how Joshua says, which He dried up for us, when he refers to the Red Sea. When he says us, he's referring to himself and other members of his generation who experienced this event. But he's only one of two adults that survived the desert. That's why I like to call him a Gen 1.5, because God is using him as a generational bridge to keep consistent his promises to the nation of Israel. Joshua relates to both this new generation and the generation of their parents. And it would actually be in this region that John the Baptist would come many years later to prepare the people anew for the coming of the kingdom of God. This was this generation's personal experience with God. Their parents had the Red Sea. Now they just had the Jordan River. By this time, God wanted to make sure that future generations would want to know about this experience and learn about it. It's not a mere event to be read in history books. It's actually a personal experience of God's providence, protection, and power. At the parting of the Red Sea, the previous generation had Moses and his staff, but had this drying of the Jordan River, this generation experienced it with Joshua, the priests, and the Ark of the Covenant. So the setting up of these stones is not to remember a mere event. It's to actually recall an entire experience. The story of God's providence and protection. Think about it. If God had not provided for your parents, your grandparents, or any of your direct ancestors, where would you be today? And now, this brings us to God's ultimate purpose in verse 24. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Joshua identifies two purposes. The first one being that these acts make known to all the inhabitants of the earth. K 
Canaan being the immediate target, that God alone is the one true God. The strength of the hand of the Lord is great, and it often occurs when God acts against those who rebel. The second purpose is directed to all Israel who heard Joshua. This sign has been accomplished in order that Israel might fear God throughout its life. To fear God is to give Him wholehearted loyalty. Both the miracle and the remembrance, as well as the exaltation of Joshua, pointed to this purpose. The miracle directed the people's attention to loyalty towards God, His covenant, and His appointed leader of the people. This final passage actually acts as a transition. It, in, it concludes the events of the crossing to which it alludes and for which Joshua erects a memorial and explains its significance. It introduces the events that will follow. Israel is now in the land of Canaan with its base at Gilgal. God has performed wonders on its behalf, which will challenge the citizens of Canaan to choose either for or against Israel and its God. In either case, they will eventually be brought to confess that Israel's God is strong and able to overcome their resistance just as He has overcome the resistance of the Red Sea and now of the Jordan. Israel will know this success as they learn to fear God. In other words, to worship and obey Him alone. With regards to the memorial stones, I leave you with this challenge. Let us share our personal God experiences so that subsequent generations may grow from them as they realize his providential hand has been at work even before they were born. So please join me in thinking through the following questions this week. What God experiences do you need your children to tell their grandchildren? Not what experiences do you want your children to tell, but what experiences do you need to tell? Think about the generations that you can't even imagine right now whether you have children or not, whether you have children who are two years old or 32 years old, what are the God experiences that you need your children to tell their own grandchildren? And what memorial stones from God do you need to pass on? Whether you're with FCBC Dallas or another local church, what memorial stones have you been holding on to that you have not yet shared with others? Do the younger generations know of the challenges that you have gone through in the past? If not, I encourage you to share them so that they can witness God's miracles in the life of your church. Secondly, what God experiences have you learned or need to learn from your parents of how your family got here? Quote unquote. Have your parents shared their memorial songs with you? What are some of their God experiences that have impacted you personally? And if you haven't done so yet, ask your parents to share some of those memorial stones with you. You'll be surprised at what you find. And I pray that you would be blessed to know that God has been working through your family, throughout the generations. And then third, what God experiences are you going through now that need that first step of faith? Are you at a point in your life right now where you know God is sending you somewhere, but you see some insurmountable obstacles in your way? Ask Him to direct your steps so that you may know how to navigate exactly where to go next. Ask a brother or sister in the Lord to walk with you. Sometimes stepping in faith together helps. 
Sometimes it's what God wants for His people to do all together. He did that with two million people. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you in humble adoration. We give thanks as you have guided us through unfamiliar territory, led us through uncertain times, and carried us through unmanageable circumstances. We praise you, O oh Lord, for your presence among us, for your power over all the earth, and for your providence through all circumstances. We thank you, Lord God, for the stories of your miraculous work that we can share to all generations. We thank you that you include us to accomplish your will for the earth. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would always obey your every command so that you would be glorified in all the earth. Whatever circumstances we are in, help us, Lord God, to take that first step of faith so that we may experience your presence, your power, and your providence in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you go, I have a few announcements for us. Today, there will be no post-worship fellowship because at 1.15, we're going to have our all-church congregational meeting. And this week, we encourage you to join us for our corporate prayer gatherings on Monday at 8.30 p.m. and Tuesday at 6 o'clock a.m., whichever works best for you, along with our halftime huddle discussions on Wednesday at 12 noon. Well, thanks again for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful week. God bless.